So let me get back to the scripture that I meant to start with today. Um, we started last week with 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, and I want to kind of touch on that first before we look actually at the life of Moses. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this, And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Paul here is writing, and he's summarizing what God's heart was from the very beginning. If we go back to Genesis chapter 1, we see that the presence of God is in a very specific place. And God puts humans there. In the Garden of Eden, God is there. Adam and Eve get to be with him and see him and walk and talk with him. And they have this full access to God, which we can hardly imagine, but we try to imagine to the best of our ability. Genesis 1.26, God says, Let us, us being the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule, he says. And he goes on to say in, in verse 27, where the scripture says that God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God he created them, male and female he created them, and God blessed them. And he said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. He tells them to go and to rule the earth. He's made man and woman in his likeness. They're made in his image. They're basically made to reflect who God is. And then to take that reflection of God and use it to subdue or to rule, to create and to cultivate, to garden and to build and to dream and to make stuff. To look at God, to have access to him, to see him, reflect him, take that reflection and reflect that into the world around them. And that is our design. We look at Genesis 1 because it reminds us of who we are. This is how God made us. We are made in the image of God and we're designed to behold him and to reflect him. So Adam and Eve were able to behold him. They had time in his presence right there with God. And then as they understood more and more of who God was and how God would do it, and they could have conversations about that, then they could go and do the things that they were called to do. We too were made to have access to God like this, to be with him, to know him. And um, they, they started that way. So the garden was God's dwelling place. And later on, when the, uh, the priests were given instructions on how to take care of the tabernacle or the temple, the same words that God uses here were given to them, that they were to rule, to create, to cultivate in that same way. It began with Adam and Eve. But the problem is this, that if you're made to um, behold, to face God, to see him and to know him, to understand him, if you're made to image God, as we are, or to reflect him, but we don't face God, then we're not able to reflect or image him well. And we see that happening in our lives, in this broken world. Um, there's a disconnect between us and God. So the reflecting that we do is warped. It becomes twisted. But God made us this way. So we, we know this, and we talked about it a little bit last week, that God made us as worshipers, and that probably sounds like church talk, but if you just compare that to how we like, live our lives, how we walk it out, the things that we look at, that we fill our eyes with, that we fill our hearts with, the things that we behold, these are things that we could say we worship. To worship something is to adore it. It's to idolize something or someone. To worship is to elevate. It's to focus on. We were made as worshipers because God made us to worship him, to behold him. When that connection is severed, when it's corrupted as it was at the fall, then we find ourselves facing or looking at or filling our eyes and our hearts and our mouths with other things. But our whole calling, all of us as humans, was rooted in facing God, worshiping him. 
And that was made, God made it that way, we believe, by design. Because whatever captivates you, whatever captivates you, whatever gets you excited, whatever has your attention, you will then reflect. We get passionate about something. It's all we want to look at. It's all we want to think about. It's all we begin talking about because it has us. We become what we behold. And humans who, um, who, who don't behold God end up creating chaos and uh, trauma. We just do. That's true for all of us. And you can see how it gets messed up and it gets warped. God's people were compromised. Their connection was interrupted. And so the reflection of him was corrupted. And if you kind of follow the story, look at the days of Noah. It was wild. Look at the Tower of Babel. Again, wild stories. And as you track along, you see how humanity has become corrupted. And so then God acts out this plan to bring his presence, his, his relationship close to his people. So we look at the life of Moses and how he encountered God and how he then, through God's inspiration and by following God's instruction, he was obedient, he leads God's people out of captivity into freedom. And we always look at this story, not always, but we usually look at the story and we focus on what God does as he leads his people out of Egypt because it's wild the plagues, and then the Red Sea, and he frees them. And if we then get to Mount Sinai, which is where I want to park for just a moment, I just want you to imagine what God's people have gone through. It's, it's so wrong to begin with. They've been in slavery for generations and generations. They have been beaten down. Their spirits are broken. And yet they've seen God. Like, they've actually seen him. He's, they, he's led them so that they can see him. And he's brought them to a place where they're free. Um, free physically. They still have some work to do. But God's whole plan all along has been to be with his people. He's trying again to restore that oneness, that closeness, and that relationship with them. The exodus was God's plan to come close, to be with them. That was his whole motivation, because God longs for his people to know him, to know him, to truly know him, and to be with him. And I might have to repeat that over and over again, because I hope that we get that, that that is God's heart, that we would know him, truly know him, and that we would be with him where he is. If you look at Mount Sinai, we're going to go to Exodus chapter 19. Um, this takes place a couple months after they leave Egypt. And what happens is that Moses goes up the mountain to meet with God. He's God's person. God's communicating through him. And God says that um, they've seen what he's done. He says this to Moses. You've seen what I've done to bring you to myself. And now he wants to come down the mountain. God is going to come down from above to be with them. Chapter, or Exodus 19, verse 5, I don't have this on the screen, forgive me, says, these are God's words. You've seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Hear God's heart, I've brought you here to myself. Now if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on earth, for all the earth belongs to me. And you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to Israel. This is what God is downloading to Moses. And I know that as we read that, we're like, oh, okay, like God wants them to obey him and keep his commandment, and then they'll be the special people. And he's talking like God does. The whole earth is his, but this is what they have to do in order to be his people. But I want us to just keep this in mind, the fact that God is a holy God. He is completely holy. There is no sin in him. There is nothing impure in him. He is perfect in every way. A holy God that cannot mix with a sinful people. He can't just be with them. And so he's providing a way for them to do the things that would allow them to be close to him so that they could be in his presence without falling dead because he's just that holy. He's that good. 
And the people, when God says this, they say, yes, they're in. They like this. Yes, we're up for it. And so God says, okay, I'm bringing myself in a thick cloud, he says, so that everybody can hear. Not just you, Moses, but so that everybody can hear and know who I am. He tells them to consecrate themselves. They're supposed to do their laundry, get clean. He has a few things that they need to do in order to experience God. And in chapter 19, verse 16, this is the story of how God shows up. It says, on the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain. Try and imagine this. Because sometimes scripture is just so wild, you're just like, yeah, okay, cool, I've heard this before. But imagine there's thunder, lightning, a thick cloud over the mountain, and a very loud trumpet blast. And everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered in smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. At the sound of the trumpet, sorry, as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up, and the Lord said to him, Go down and warn the people so they do not force their way through to see the Lord, and many of them perish. So here, there's hundreds of thousands, probably millions of people at the, at the base of the mountain. I think the census said that there was around 600-something men, and we know that if there's that many men, then we have to factor in the women and the children. So we're not talking about just a few people who experienced this. There was crowds and crowds and crowds of people. And as they're beholding this mountain, God himself descends on the mountain, and it sounds like thunder, and the, the, his presence is like fire. Imagine, this morning as I was driving to church, I leave through my neighborhood, and there's a beautiful view this morning of golden ears. You can see the, the mountains, and they're just lit up. And as I looked at them today, I was trying to imagine how I would react if all of a sudden fire just fell on that mountain. It was on fire, so much so that there's just a cloud of billowing smoke, and it's God. And his presence is so tangible and real that it shakes. The whole ground is shaking. And God shows up here in the most terrifying way because he needs these people to not be sinful so that he can be with them. He's showing them his strength and his power so that their awe of him would change their behavior, so that they would recognize his strength and his power and his grandeur like this is just amazing he's coming to them but he's doing it in this wild way and he wants them to not be sinful so that he can come and be with them and he establishes kind of all these rules so that they'll do, take the steps there's a, a period of testing where they need to do what he's asking of them so that he can come to them so they can be together and as you move through uh, the scripture you see that God downloads for them a law code, the law, which is a way of living that would allow them to honor him, to walk with him. And he, he downloads the commandments. He later gives plans for the ark and the tabernacle. And as you look through it, if you're looking for God's heart and what he desires, you can see that he's trying to make a way so that he can be with these people. He's essentially saying, I want to come to you. Do this so that we can do this together, so we can be together. But the tragedy is, and you already know this, but I hope it breaks our heart all over again today. The tragedy is that they see God. You guys, they experienced him. Can you imagine if we saw God in that way? They see him, and they hear him, and yet they told Moses to go. They told Moses to go. They said, Moses, you go. You go back up the mountain. And it was too much for them. They couldn't deal with the tension of God's holiness. So they delegated to Moses again. You're able to go back and forth. You go do it. You go do it. And we see in Exodus chapter 20, verse 18, when they saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet, when they saw the smoke, they trembled with fear. And they stayed at a distance. And they said to Moses, 
Speak to us yourself and we'll listen. Moses, you go ahead and you just tell us what God wants. What is he saying? You speak to us and we'll listen to you. But their fear overwhelmed them so much that they said, do not have God speak to us or we will die. And Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you and keep you from sinning. But the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. And while Moses goes on to draw near to God, and he is transformed by what he sees and what he hears, God's people don't draw near to his presence. And so Moses is changed, but the people are very much not. Moses was so radically changed, actually, that he, when he was with God, when he spent time with God, when he would go to speak to the people, his face was a glow. He was glowing just from being close to God in such a way that he had to put uh, a veil over his face so that it wouldn't offend everybody. It was too much. It was blinding to them. Just that like reflection from God's presence. They couldn't handle the glory that was radiating from him. And we see that the people, instead of going to God himself, they turn to idolatry. And you guys, we're so judgmental of these people because we hear the story and we think, are you kidding me? They chose and they had Aaron lead them and they made a golden calf and they called that calf Yahweh. They gave him God's name and they worshiped the calf, a golden calf. They took all their jewelry and they melted it and shaped something and they worshiped that instead of worshiping God, instead of pursuing God. What they did is they created something that they could get their heads around something that wasn't too much for them, something that they could kind of understand. It wasn't going to uh, terrify them. The calf wasn't going to offend them. The calf wasn't going to overpower them. And so instead of pursuing this terrifying but beautiful and awe-inspiring closeness with God who made them and who had just rescued them and who had led them and wanted to be close to them, Instead of going to God, they worshipped this calf, something that they, they could understand and comprehend, which is ridiculous. We know this. And we do the exact same thing. We love it when somebody has answers for us so that we can just kind of subscribe to their theology. You go ahead. You just download it. I'll, I'll fall under that. We love it when other people have a relationship with God, when they're leading us well and pursuing God and just come and download what God has said. And we believe completely in leadership. We believe that God puts people in places that as the body of Christ, we need each one of us operating in our calling and our gifts. We do it together, each one of us in our place. And they delegated the, the relationship with God. They delegated the authority to somebody else. And they delegated their worship to a statue. And when I read this and studied it, I just want to say that it messed with my heart a little bit. That here's God so desiring to be with them. And instead, they turned to something else. Psalm 106, 20 says, They exchanged their glorious God for an image of a bull which eats grass. And today, today, where we live today, because of what Jesus has done, because Jesus has come, and he has become a curse for us, and he died for each one of us. He hung on a cross for us. We just celebrated communion together. His blood was spilled. His body was broken out of love for us. This is God loving us. Because Jesus has come and paid the price for our sin, for our neglect of God's presence, for our um, worship of other things, other people, other priorities. Because of Jesus today, we have this access to God's presence that they couldn't have dreamed of back then. There was a veil that Moses had to put over his face because just that reflection of God was too much for the people. 
And when Jesus came, we know that, that the veil that was in the, the uh, temple, it was ripped. It was ripped from the top to the bottom. Anything that would separate us from God's relationship, presence, closeness, nearness, that was done away with. That isn't a thing any longer. Now we have full access. Now Holy Spirit, he comes to live in us, tabernacle in us, make his home in us. We're called to be with him. And we so often, we just, I don't know, I, we don't see it. We take it for granted. God's done everything that needs to be done so that you and I can know him. And that's his heart, that we would know him. That we would be known by him fully. That he would live in us. We get stuck on the rules and the ways. You know, we look at all the, the law that God gave his people. It was really important because that was his way of being and of living that allowed his holiness to come close. But it was never just about the law. Jesus fulfilled the law. It was always about his being known. He wants you to know him. That is his desire and that is our privilege. We touched on this last week, but I'll wrap up here. That God isn't so much interested in a people that um, behave like him. Not that that's a bad thing. If you behave like God, props. You are doing some things right. But he's not about that. It's not about people who behave like him. But he wants people who become like him. God knows oh, I can't do that without him. I can't do it without him. We can't become like him unless he does it. He's going to have to do that work, but he does. Back to 2 Corinthians 3, let me wrap it up here. Verse 7, it says, Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, and it came with glory when God downloaded those Ten Commandments so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was. Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? My prayer is that we would see his glory, that we would see him, that you would see his heart toward us. It goes on to say, therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, that veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Whenever anyone turns to the Lord, that veil is taken away. There is a veil, and I know that some of you can just feel it, sense it. I'm so aware of it. Just bringing a message today. My words mean squat. But we've been praying that you would hear God calling you, speaking to you as he did to his people in this story. That Holy Spirit would be drawing you toward Jesus, saying, come, come to me. Come to me, look at me. Look at me. Look past all the rest of it. Please don't look at me, look at him. And that as you put your eyes on him, that veil would be taken away. That a spirit of revelation would be released. That you would see Jesus. Because if we would see Jesus, 
would change and it is changing everything. Look at him. We were made to crave and desire God, to worship God. The appetites of our heart are strong. And if you don't perhaps feel that, that urgency, the longing for him, it might be because your appetites have been satisfied by other things. I know that has been true in my life before, where I'm looking to other things. I get like a small hit of joy from other things. And yet there's something so much greater, so much more beautiful, so much more fulfilling that is on offer for us. And as we've been looking at what that looks like, that we all together, we all get to behold his glory, then what happens as we look at him is we are changed. We reflect that glory. It changes us, and then we become a reflection to others around us. We get so exhausted sometimes trying to do the right thing and say the right words and act the right way, where God is all about us looking at him, seeing him in such a way that nothing else matters, that he is who I'm reflecting, not Angela and her best efforts, but him, God himself. We have to be satisfied in him, or we will gorge on all kinds of other things, which is really just like junk food. It's my birthday today, and so I can eat whatever I want to today, right? But if I do that, because I'm 47, at the end of the day, I'm going to feel like garbage. And so I know that my best bet is to fill up on some good food, some good stuff, so that then everything else doesn't have that much appeal. Here's our promise. Psalm 34, 5 tells us that those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. This is my prayer for us today. Those who look to him will be radiant with joy. That shame will not darken our faces. That's the promise for each one of us. We're going to go to prayer in just a moment. And I'm just reminded of Moses' life, how he walked, and how he had an encounter with God. He was an old man. It wasn't at the beginning of his life. He was already an old man. But he was out in the desert, and he saw a, a bush on fire. I obviously wasn't planning this, so I didn't wear the right shoes. Give me a moment. feet aren't that pretty, but I'm going to take my shoes off. There was a, a bush that's on fire, and that wouldn't have been a big deal because that probably happened a lot, a brush fire, but it gets Moses' attention, and he looks at it, and he realizes that it's not burning up. It's not consuming the plant. And so he stops. And some translations say that he turned, he turned aside. He stopped to consider what was happening. Gets his attention. And as he looks, God speaks to him. And tells him, take your shoes off. This is holy ground. And he takes his shoes off. And it's just this moment of awe where God got his attention and marked him, I believe, at that point. God had already been working in Moses' life, if you look at his story. But at this point, he sees and he hears from God, and he realizes that he's on holy ground. There's something supernatural that's happening that God is bringing him into. And for you and I today, I just want to tell you that this right here is holy ground. Not just where I'm sta standing, it's not the platform. Where you are 
is holy ground. When you go home today, that is holy ground. When you go to your job this week, when you're having perhaps difficult conversations, we're all having some difficult conversations this week, that is holy ground. He is right there. He is with you. He wants to get your attention. I believe he wants to mark us so that we're ruined for anything else but God. As Moses lived out his life, he had to do things that were wild. He was called to do things that were way above his pay grade. But God, God had marked him in such a way that he knew whose he was and what he was called to do. And when others looked at the holiness of God and shrunk back, he pursued him. He went further. He spent time with God. He valued his presence. And as we go to pray today, I just want to do this. I want to invite you that if you would welcome God's presence today in a fresh new way, and I want to tell you, you can have the confidence that his presence is yours. He is with you. If you're a child of God, that isn't something you have to question. But I pray that these days that we're walking in, I believe that these days we're walking in require a fresh encounter with God over and over again. I know that he's doing that for me, and I want to pray that he would meet you right here today as well. This is holy ground. So as we go to pray, if that's your heart, if you'd say, God, I want to see you. Show me your glory just as Moses prayed. Would you stand to your feet if you're able and just join me? We'll pray together. If you're at home, go ahead, stand to your feet. You're holy. Holy, the whole earth is filled with your glory. God, fill us with your presence, with your glory. God, I pray that you would open our eyes, that we would see you. We pray just like Moses did, show us your glory, God. If you're not going with us, we don't want to take one step. We don't want to go anywhere without you. And God, we repent of how we've turned to other things, other distractions, other small pleasures, God, where we've been obsessed with anything that isn't you. God, we repent today. We repent. God, we turn from our wicked ways. And instead, we turn toward you. We turn our eyes upon Jesus. We choose to look you in the face today. May we be a church that beholds you, that sees you, that isn't satisfied with anything but you. And God, I pray right here in this moment, right here on March 27th, that you would meet us, mark us, God, that you would sear in our eyes, on our heart, in our spirit, God, a longing for, a craving for you, more of you. God, I pray that your church, your house, would be a house of prayer. That we would be longing to run to your house, to be praying with others, to encourage one another. I pray that this would be a healing place, God. That your miraculous power would show up and heal hearts, heal bodies, God. We thank you that wherever you are, that there are signs of your goodness. And I pray that as we go this week, God, that we'd have our eyes to see you. That when our eyes are full of you, that everything we experience, God, the people that we encounter, we see you right there in them, in all things. God, will you be our God and we will be your people. And we'll be content to wait on you. We won't run ahead of you. But God, when you call, we will answer. When you ask us to move, I pray that we'd obey. I bless your family, your church today. In the name of Jesus, amen.